Uh, hey folks, little update today. Um, I don't actually have a lot of new information um, on our call today with the analyst team. Uh, I think we all kind of agreed we're in a little bit of information saturation and um, I feel like our information had grown geometrically over the previous week and then we've now, you know, basically asymptoted on knowledge. Every time I go back and speak with you know, someone who's a real expert, we realize we're kind of in this static state of knowledge. Um, so, I'll, I'll, I mean, the few things to say, one is the uh, Johns Hopkins site was down for much of today. Um, so we didn't really have an accurate count of new cases, but you may recall from some of the videos that went up yesterday, one of the things we're tracking, and, and certainly we're not alone in tracking this, of course, I don't wanna suggest we're doing anything brilliant here, um, but but we are really you know following the concavity of the new case reports. So um, the the data that we have suggests obviously we're still above one. I think the growth rate from yesterday to today was one point one three in the United States, or maybe it was one point one five. But uh, again, uh, we you know when that number falls below one, we start to feel pretty good. Um, I think the other big news today is. Um, losing confidence in the idea of angiotensin receptor blockade um, as a strategy. This was something we were super excited about last Friday uh, based on a 2005 paper that we saw in the um, virus, the coronavirus that had caused SARS um, that, uh, you know, really had us thinking that maybe short-term use of an ARB, which is not the same as an, an, uh, an ACE inhibitor, by the way, uh, would be a viable prophylactic agent or potentially a viable treatment agent. Uh, I think it is safe to say I do not feel that that is the case today. Um, and everybody I've talked to is seemingly as confused. So if folks have information that they think we haven't seen, please uh, attach it, you know, or point to it um, either here or in um, Twitter. Um, the other thing that we are really struggling to get a hold of, and, and truthfully, it's kind of frustrating the hell out of me, is we don't have great clinical ops papers on the following. So we have papers that talk about all the people that get hospitalized, here is their clinical course. Infected here, fever here, sore throat here, respiratory failure here. Um, even interpreting those papers, and there was one that came out yesterday afternoon that is kind of a mediocre paper in that the numbers don't really add up and maybe that just means we're stu too stupid to figure it out maybe it means the paper is just sort of sloppy um, and not to be critical of it because I know people are rushing to get things out but it, what's what's more important and I don't know how long it's going to take to get it is the paper that includes the non-hospitalized patients because what we really want to understand is people who get infected that don't go on to require hospitalization. So, you know, good job if you're in that 80% of that camp or maybe closer to 90%, depending on which country. Um, but it's still important to know who those people are. And especially in the United States, when we don't yet have testing at a, a sufficient enough level. Why? Because those people need to be isolated. So if you're positive for, COVID, for, for the, uh, the, the SARS-CoV-2, um, and even if we had a crystal ball that said, you're never gonna go on to have any respiratory sequelae or require hospitalization, you can still go on to infect someone who will. And so if anybody is seeing literature out there that is showing the time course of disease in non-hospitalized people, which obviously by definition can't be US literature, it has to be probably literature out of uh, China or Korea, uh, maybe Italy, um, that would be really valuable. I'd love to see that because that would provide great insight for what percentage of people, for example, that get infected, develop a fever, and what's the time course of getting the fever of, of people who don't go on to require hospitalization. So I hope I'm explaining that correctly. What you're trying to understand is what the symptom is and what the time course is to receive that symptom. So what fraction gets symptom A and at what and what is the median or mean time and standard deviation of that? And you should have that for five or six symptoms in a cohort that don't go to the hospital. That's really interesting data. I haven't seen it yet. Um, if somebody is aware of those data, please point us to them. Um, okay, I think that's kind of the update for now. I'm sorry, I don't have anything really exciting or interesting to say. Oh, I think on the promising side, actually, I will close with one thing. I think that the uh, Gilead Ebola drug uh, continues to look promising. So it looked promising a week ago. 
it looks no less promising today. And that's really good news because a number of things that looked promising a week ago today don't look very promising. So um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that that drug can continue to be investigated um, and can obviously be sort of short tracked to uh, the use. Uh, just so people don't say, how do I go out and get it? Unfortunately, at this point in time, a compassionate exemption is required. Uh, to utilize that drug and therefore of course it's being reserved for patients uh, who are in the hospital and who are otherwise progressing through all standard treatments. Anyway, I hope this update was uh, somewhat helpful uh, and uh, you know tomorrow we'll, we'll um, continue to update folks based on what we're learning. Uh, but thank you for sharing your information back with us.